So without uh, further ado, I want to introduce Mike Montalto, who has also been working with CLIP for a long time. And um, he has been sucked into work, working for Path AI, one of the big AI players in pathology. And uh, I think he's enjoying it there. And he agreed to come talk with us today. So hi, Mike. Good to see you. And uh, I'll let you take it over. Yeah. Hi, Sandy. Thanks uh, very much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you sound great. Great. Okay. And hey, Cliff, great talk. Uh, good to see you again. I wish we were all in the great. same room. Likewise. And, yeah. And, and others as well. Richard, good to see you. I'm not going to talk about things that go miserably wrong. So I hope I don't just <laughs> go you know, right out of the gate. <laughs> um, in fact, I didn't even know I was giving this talk up until a few hours ago. So I, so I tried to string <laughs> together. Uh, hopefully this will be cogent. Um, and Eric, Eric and, volunteered you. So you can Eric did. Out. I know. <laughs> I think Eric's actually on the call. So we'll <laughs> see how this goes. Um, anyway, but it's, I'm happy to be here. Uh, let me share my screen with you guys. Uh, let's see. Okay, you guys are seeing, hopefully you're seeing the right. Yep, it looks good. Is that all good? Yep. Okay, fantastic. Um, I do have, uh, like Cliff, wait, I, I, Cliff, that was great too. You got it all in time. I have, feel as though I have too many slides, so I'm gonna go probably pretty quickly. Um, you guys know I, I work for Path AI, that's my only disclosure. So uh, I'm gonna, I'm, this is gonna be a little bit more applications focused, I think a little bit less salesy about what Path AI you know, offers. I'll try to cover a little bit of that in the beginning um, and then kind of get into the application. So a little bit about um, where I think that AI and pathology can play a role in drug development and the drug development process where, where we have seen it really gaining traction there and having utility. And then I'll try to give some very specific uh, examples uh, of what I mean. Um, this is a little bit about the company. So it was founded in 2016 by Andy Beck and uh, Ditya Kosla. Um, we uh, have about 170 people now growing uh, quite, I was employee number 80 only a year and a half ago. So, so growing very quickly, uh, headquartered in Boston. Um, we're venture backed, uh, but also have some strategic investors, including from uh, Merck Global Home and Innovation Fund, LabCorp, and Bristol Myers Squibb. Um, in terms of the platforms and the way that we think about what we do, unlike uh, what we just heard from Akoya and VizioFarm, we don't really sell our platforms into the, into the uh, research space specifically. We do sell more of our services into that space. Um, and our platforms, in terms of the way that we offer those services, mirror the drug development continuum. So um, translational research and exploratory research, looking at a lot of retrospective analysis and clinical trials, a lot of hypothesis generation there. Um, and then we also have built platforms where we can deploy algorithms into prospective trials. We use, uh, we have a thing called CTS, which is a clinical trial services platform. It's built under GCP, GCLP. Uh, we too will be expecting our Clio license very soon so we can run clinical trials and enroll patients. Um, and we can develop under 1345 and 62304. I hope you guys can hear my dogs. They're very excited about that part. And uh, and then I think we can go further than that uh, beyond just clinical trials work and into actual IVD development as um, we have an IVD or diagnostic platform that's also a deployable platform um, that can be rolled out into clinical laboratories as well. And we have various partnerships and ways to do that. Either we can integrate algorithms onto existing platforms like UPath at Roche or Leica's platforms, or we can do it uh, with our own internal platform. So that's, I'm not really talking much about that. Um, one of the things that we have built that we think is something that's really helpful for us in developing high quality algorithms fairly quickly uh, is we've built a, um, a crowdsourcing based pathology network. So annotations, as everybody knows, is a real bottleneck in developing high quality uh, pathology based algorithms, unless you're going to do end to end, which we also do. But there are circumstances where having um, pathologists really annotate cells and tissue is really helpful for us. So we have about 315 or more US board certified pathologists who are who have access in our can log on to this network. They receive jobs from us on a daily basis, which is essentially around annotating cells and tissue. And then we use those to feed into our models for uh, training. We have uh, about, about 9 million annotations now uh, across many different disease types. So that helps us build models pretty quickly. So that's it about the company. Um, I think this, this group knows a lot about the, the virtues of, of uh, AI powered image analysis versus manual microscopy, manual microscopy having fairly or, or higher error rates, a lot of inter and inter observer variability, a general lack of standardization. And I think most importantly on the bottom, that's really something uh, that, that we keyed in on it when I, during my time at Bristol Myers Squibb was, was the scalability part of this. If you, even if you have a scoring algorithm that you think is interesting, 
scaling that out to multiple cohorts in exploratory way is difficult because you have to train either many pathologists, you have to try to really study the inter-observer variability uh, and then see and then tease out between any signal you might find as being real versus uh, the, the error that's coming in from your, from your reader studies. So um, in terms of utility opportunities, we think for AI-based pathology, they fall, in my opinion, into these two main buckets, bio, these two main markets, I would say, biopharma research, as well as clinical diagnostics. And, and the utility drivers in biopharma is, the name of the game there is increasing the probability of regulatory and technical success of any drug program, um, and ultimately improving patient outcomes, which really we hope is the motivator for these companies. And then in the clinical diagnostic space, the motivator is improving patient outcomes as the main one, but also improving costs and quality of the lab as a whole is also a, a second uh, one as well that we see a lot of utility in, in image analysis and pathology. So this talk is gonna focus primarily on the top and looking at increasing the regulatory probability of regulatory success. Pharma is a huge space, uh, everything from discovery, target identification, and all the way through to post-market approval studies. So really what I'm focusing on is the translational aspects of that activity where we're getting into early phase trials and late trials and using patient samples to really inform the drug development strategies. So that's where we sort of, when I was in, in pharma, that's where we really saw a sweet spot for this technology. So I'm kind of focusing there. And in the translational space, we can do, like I said, retrospective for a host of reasons, and we can do perspective for other hosts of reasons, which I won't necessarily get into. Um, but this, here's a, here, you know, I'll just spend a second here. So the, the validation of AI and pathology, we, we know that there are important differences between clinical validation and clinical utility. Analytical and clinical validations don't examine, the, don't examine the test performance against patient outcomes necessarily. And one of the challenges in image analysis, whether it's for pathology or radiology, is that validation has, in, in terms of reader performance and the measures of accuracy have really been against reader performance and not necessarily against outcomes. And there's a lot of reasons for that. The utility studies are very time consuming, getting well curated and large data sets for with outcomes, uh, particularly and particularly from randomized control clinical trials is hard to do. Not everybody has access to those. Um, and, you know, if you're training an algorithm against the gold standard readers, why would you expect there to be any enhanced performance in terms of outcomes? So that's always kind of puzzled me quite a bit. Um, so one of the things that we, we thought a lot about in Path AI was how do we validate our algorithms? How do, we do, how do we do the kind of analytical validation that you want that you believe that the algorithms are really seeing what you think that they're seeing, but try not to also validate them against the, the higher level pathologist manual read at the very same time. So I'll give you some examples of what we, how we decided to, to deal with that. So, um, and I'll, I'll go through how we did model development and using this example. For first example is pdl one IHC, which uh, we talked a little bit about in the previous talk. So um, a lot of interest in this particular space. It's a biomarker that can predict response to anti-PD-1 or PDL one checkpoints. And several uh, indications, there have been complementary companion diagnostic approvals, and just listing the ones here in non-small cell lung cancer, which is already outdated. I, I think that Bristol-Myers Squibb has a first line indication from the Checkmate 227 trial in the, in the um, uh, Nevo IPI combo in first line therapy where they have a, um, a complement, a uh, companion diagnostic indication. But nonetheless, you get the point that um, there are multiple cut points, multiple clones for one indication. So it's a fairly complex testing space just in, in PDL1 um, in lung. And manual assessment of PDL1 is challenging due to the variability of the assay scoring. Um, you can have tumor based scoring or uh, immune based scoring or CPS. Um, there's heterogeneity in PDL1 expression, um, both within samples as well as temporally. And there's just challenging and scoring, particularly immune cells. And I think David Rem's done a really good job through the blueprint study and others showing just how variable immune cell scoring is for PDL1. Um, so digital AI has, uh, could improve PDL1 expression. And so we developed a, and validated an AI powered algorithm to quantitate PDL1. And importantly here, the relationship between prevalence and efficacy in NEVO studies is what we decided to try to validate this on and see whether or not this had any true utility uh, in doing something so, like that. So Mike, with, with yep. the um, variability in staining being a, a critical issue, how, how does AI help? Is AI well, figuring out when your staining's no good? We're not, well, it could, that's a really good point, but we're not solving for that here. Um, 
we could, I mean, in, in some ways you can create, if you wanted to, a, um, you can create sort of standards to see if your staining is off. You also could create a harmonization based algorithm, which, which we've been asked to do as well. And we're sort of working on that at the moment. The reason I list all of these different things is just to be comprehensive that AI doesn't solve all of the problems. <laughs> so you've kind of keyed in on it. It's only solving in any ways the, the inter and intra reader variability and potentially sensitivity, but keeping the assay in this control conditions, keeping the assay the same. Um, so in this case, we're, we're talking about the 288 clone from uh, Agilent, which were the studies that were done at Bristol Myers Squibb for their uh, PDL1 indications. Cool. Sorry, a quick question. Um, I, I presume this is a very complicated space because of the FDA has sort of weigh, weighed in and said, you can do this, you can't do that. So what, how does the FDA sort of overlie all of this crap? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question, Richard. Like, uh, they, um, this is just exploratory research, so they're not, in, they're not sticking their noses in here just yet. If the question is, after I show you this wonderful data, that how would we take this forward into the FDA world, um, they, you know, they're, they're very interested in something like this. They're interested in AI. They're interested in having standardization and tools. And you know, to the degree that you can demonstrate that it's clinically validated um, for its intended use, if it's a lab developed test central, central site lab developed test, for example, or a single site test, you know, as long as you can show the clinical, um, analytical and clinical performance for them, I think that they're fine. They'll treat this like anything else. If we, if we, and we know this because we've had many discussions with them, if we were to go forward with a pdl one AI-based assay, the criteria that they use to give FDA approvals for manual assays is a similar criteria they would use here, right? Does that make, is it my answering your question? Yeah, yeah. But they're not afraid of it and they're, they're, they're quite interested in it um, for sure. So we, we developed training. Uh, we trained an algorithm to be able to segment normal tumor stroma tissue at a tissue level and then PDL1 positivity at a cellular level. We, we um, trained for tumor cells, macrophages, and lymphocytes in this case, PDL1 positive and PDL1 negative. We, we trained on about 250,000 pathologist annotations using that network, that, that crowdsourcing network I was referring to. And then we validated it on frames-based uh, validation, we call it. So this is where we try to get away from that issue of um, a patient level or a slide level score as being our validation method. So I'll show you on the next slide how we, how we do that. Um, but essentially, we're validating against a consensus of pathologist reading. And then we, well, then we test this on a held out um, test set. And then we look at outcome. So on the validation part for um, frames-based validation, we essentially randomly generate out of a series of whole site images 10,000 distinct frames. We get a distribution of those frames in terms of how many cells are each in each frame. We use an algorithm for that as well that we generally trust, um, so that we so that we are um, having you know high, low, medium, and a distribution of cells and positivity. And but then ultimately, what we do is we have five readers go through um, hundreds of frames and and say this is positive, this is negative, this is a lymphocyte, this is a macrophage, this is tissue, this is you know, epithelial, et cetera. Um, and that's how we validate it for the model. And so we have very good correlations between how the model um, predicts PDL1 positive tumor cells here as an example, or PDL1 positive immune cells versus the readers. And actually the readers are pretty good on immune cells when you're giving them frames, frames, you know, frame-based validations, when they're really focusing in. If you give them a region and say, Waldo is in here somewhere and there's not that much to look at, they're gonna get it right. Well, it's gonna be a little bit easier than doing whole site image. Oh, I'm sorry, quick point of uh, question. <clears throat> I haven't looked at this kind of stuff, but I, my understanding was that macrophages are very hard to identify. They are. So yes. What do you do, Richard? That's something that could go terribly wrong on us. So <laughs> I, I think, <laughs> I think you're right. So we, you know, we've done. We spent a lot of time and energy, and had a lot of Q, we QC all of our pathologist annotations with other readers who are experts to make sure that the model is indeed picking the cell types that we think. I think that macrophages, particularly PDL1 negatives, um, unless we did an actual macrophage stain like CD68 and then did overlays to show the, to show the correlations are really strong. It's hard to, you know, we're, we're just relying on our visual as, as best we can. That's a study that is out there to do for us and, and that we want to do, which is correlate to um, CD68 staining or something. So really good point. And I'm not going to show any of the outcome data on macrophages specifically because that, because you brought up that point, but I, that is a point that uh, we, I don't feel perfectly good about. So for this study, we're just looking at tumor cells, which was pretty easy uh, for people to believe or uh, is uh, accurate. So once we, we developed the algorithm again to a, a pretty good correlation statistic, and we believe that we're able to see PDL1 positive and negative tumor cells, 
Then we deployed the algorithm on three independent um, clinical trial cohorts, Checkmate 67, which was on melanoma. Um, in fact, actually all of these are melanoma in this particular study. So 67, 238, and 275, um, looking at, um, uh, I think these are, these are monotherapies with, yeah, with nivolumab. Um, so now we look in, this, in these patient cohorts, um, how well do we compare to the actual whole site image score of PDL1? one um, And here you can see our correlation coefficients of about 0.6, not great actually. Um, and the reason that it's not great is because we, we have a tendency to pick up additional samples identified by the digital only. So there are about 24% more patients identified in the digital. So these are patients who would have been negative by manual and positive by digital. We don't see that this would be a very lopsided off diagonal if I was looking at a two by two. Um, and so we generally at multiple cut points and across these three trials, we see a general higher sensitivity of picking up PDL1 um, at, at these two cut points. So then the next big question for us is, well, what does that really, what does that mean? And what's happening with those patients? You know, those patients actually responders or not. So when we look at across these three trials at these two different cut points, look at the hazard ratios of biomarker positive versus biomarker negative for patients that are positive by both, you know, genuine positives, they, they have a, a strong correlation to a NEVO response with a good uh, hazard ratio. And those that are um, negative are actually identified um, by manual only don't. But those patients that are sort of in the middle, they were, they were negative by manual, but then became positive, have a trend or a tendency to, to trend towards patients who respond to nivolumab therapy. Um, so we do think that we are picking up um, a, a good amount of patients who are likely to respond who we would consider potentially true positive um, patients. When we go back and we, I don't show this data, but when we go back and we look at the whole study statistic as if we used the digital AI, um, we don't see any difference in the study statistics or outcome statistics. So we could have used the AI we could have brought in a few more patients and it really wouldn't have changed the study statistics at all, which is, which is great. And in many ways, it means that we potentially could identify more patients who are eligible for drug uh, and life-saving therapies if we use an AI approach versus using a manual approach, at least in these studies and in this indication. We have done this in many more indications and we, we have a paper under review right now that we, we hope will come out later this year. Um, so in the interest of keeping going through time, that was our pdl one story. Um, the story here, another one on CD8. This isn't really gonna be necessarily against outcome. This is a little bit more exploratory where we were interested in, in looking at um, different patterns of CD8 expressions. I'm sure many people in this room are aware of the, what was the, the brisk and non-brisk and the absent, which, which in today's world, I think is, is cold and excluded phenotype and inflamed phenotype for CD8 uh, positive T cells. And, and the inflamed phenotype, absent of therapy is associated with better prognostic because these cells are, um, you know, there's immune mediated responses to tumor, but also in the IO world, um, there are correlations of higher, having a higher IO response in the inflamed as well, um, phenotype and lower response in the cold. And so we, the, the group at uh, BMS was interested in trying to understand some of the molecular alterations or molecular associations that may associate with these different phenotypes within their clinical trials. So we built a CD8 um, algorithm this gets to that point I was making about being able to deploy something at scale. Uh, this would be hard to do if we just had one or two pathologists doing this and, and setting a cup point and really um, saying something is excluded or something is inflamed um, and really being able to do this um, in a little more standardized way. So we built a CD8 based model um, and validated it. That was against the, and uh, that was a, um, uh, against readers as well. I'm not showing any of the validation data, but we are able to identify the immune desert phenotype, the immune excluded phenotype, where we have a lot of CD8 cells in the stroma and not in the parenchyma, uh, and then both as the inflamed phenotype. Um, and then we're, we take each patient in the population and we sort of set a bit of a cut point to say if they were higher in the stromal, but lower in the parenchymal or higher in parenchymal, low in stroma, or are they balanced? Uh, what, is the what do the gene expressions look like for these particular different groups of patient populations? And what we found was that um, there was a, sig a significant upregulation of CSF1R in patients who had high stromal abundance. Um, and the same gene was significantly downregulated as our most downregulated gene uh, for patients that had high parenchymal abundance. So this was relevant for drug um, target teams who are interested in 
Uh, CSF1R is a potential target for resistance mechanisms, and this helps them understand in a patient population that they may decide to go into for future trials that maybe the excluded phenotype is a potential selection mechanism for them. Um, and there are lots of studies that are ongoing to see if that hypothesis is true. Hopefully we'll be able to share some of that data uh, in the future as well. Um, I know this is a, an NCI sort of mediated thing. I'm gonna give a little bit of an example of NASH uh, just because I think this is a great example of how another way in which AI can improve drug development paradigms. Um, NASH is a, uh, a subcomponent of fatty liver disease with very high prevalence. And there's been a lot of activity. There's not really good therapies here, but there's been a lot of drug development activities in order to develop it. Um, therapies to reverse or slow the progression of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is NASH. And uh, interestingly, to determine drug efficacy for NASH is a histological endpoint. So the FDA has come out in a draft guidance essentially saying that you have, there are two components to NASH that you have to resolve and or hold steady. One is the um, histological components of um, uh, uh, the, the NASH score, which is ballooning uh, steatosis and inflammation or, and or fibrosis. So they're looking for holding fibrosis steady, but reducing these other measures or holding these other measures steady and reducing fibrosis in the liver. And that is going to be an, ex an endpoint for potential accelerated approval because NASH has such a long duration of, to clinical events that these are so associated with clinical events that they would allow accelerated approvals based on these histological endpoints. And that's a big deal. The problem is that the interreader and intrareader variability of those particular histological endpoints is terrible. Um, Stata hepatitis, lobular inflammation, and ballooning, just showing here the interreader concordance of several biopsies from clinical trials. And there's a huge amount of interreader variability in that particular measure. And that has a big impact on powering of a study of this sort. So this was a, a um, simulated kind of a, a thought experiment, so to speak, that was published. As to, what, as to what power you might need depending on what variability you have in reading the endpoints. So if there was a theoretical true response rate of 20%, but your placebo was 10%, you have an odds ratio of over two, the probability at P.05 of really seeing that effect, um, if you have really good agreement in your endpoint of these endpoints I'm talking about, you'd have a very high probability of seeing that drug effect. But when you have Kappa statistics like the one I just sort of showed you, you have a much lower probability of seeing true drug effect and your odds ratio is gonna be much worse. So this is a big deal. And there's been a lot of press about this in, in the NASH world and a lot of spectacular failures that have happened with people pointing towards the histological endpoint as being a contributing factor into the challenge of getting NASH drugs um, approved. So uh, we're, you know, we've been working in this space for a long time. We, we've developed um, machine learning based models to be able to measure um, the forms of the um, histological endpoints of NASH, data hepatitis, ballooning, and inflammation by doing series of annotations, as I had mentioned earlier, building and training the model and then validating it at that level. For fibrosis, we did more of an end-to-end. -end. We, we, we fed machine learning models uh, patients who were diagnosed as either F1, F2, F3, or F4 stages of fibrosis, and then we had the model learn in more of a black box type of approach to develop um, uh, models of fibrosis. And using that approach, we were able, most, most biopsies have a single score of fibrosis. We were able to get a distribution of fibrosis using that type of an approach across each uh, sample. This is just showing against the pathologist score, how we correlate to a consensus uh, reading for inflammation, ballooning, and stea stea um, stea um, steatosis, uh, where our scores have a tendency to agree with the scores of pathologists. Um, Similarly for fibrosis, our machine learning based score uh, has a tendency to agree with the pathologist based consensus score for fibrosis. Um, and here's just showing what I was talking about before. We can get a distribution of fibrosis using a machine learning based approach versus, uh, versus a manual approach. So then we, what we did, so there was a, a trial that was run by Gilead called the ATLAS trials, a phase two trial looking at mono and combo therapies in NASH. Um, these were uh, long studies, I think 48 weeks was from time zero to, to, time, um, to the time point where they wanted to see if they had any changes. They were looking at fibrosis as a one stage change in fibrosis as the main endpoint. And the take home on this slide is that 11% of the patients had a one stage reduction in fibrosis in the placebo. And the best drug effect that they saw was in the silo fur arm where they had 21% patients uh, who had a, at least one stage change in fibrosis. And this was not considered statistically significant and they did not meet their endpoint as a result of that. Um, 
we used our machine learning based fibrosis score, which is a, again, a quantitative continuous score. And we show significant, we show a nice dose response. But we also show a, a, a I mean, not dose response, a, a nice response to these um, drugs that have varying degrees, but the combo does the best. Uh, where we see a statistically significant um, decrease in the fibrosis score and machine learning based fibrosis score. We also see a significantly uh, signif um, a statistically significant decrease in the amount of F4, which is the last, you know, the worst, the worst stage of fibrosis, and proportionally a larger amount of F2, which if you are replacing the later stage fibrosis with earlier stage fibrosis, you might expect that to happen. So these, these were nice findings and it did indicate to the drug company that we indeed have drug activity, even though we weren't um, statistically significant for an endpoint. If this were an endpoint, uh, they may have been on the market uh, by now. So the, these are important considerations for these drug trials. Um, there are other, there are other uh, you may be interested, of course, this team knows, I'm sure, complete pathological response and ulcerative colitis are areas that the FDA has issued guidances on for similarly having histological endpoints that would be relevant for potential accelerated approvals. Last example I'm going to give, um, which was a work that, that we published a, about a month or so ago in Nature Communication, um, just showing the power of, of AI now at a broader level. And, and here what we developed was, um, what we wanted to do was create a way that we could predict genotypes um, and expression patterns using H and E images. There's been a lot of literature in this space nowadays as well. So the, I'm not sure that this is anything particularly new. The new part of this particular study was that instead of feeding the machine learning based um, uh, models end to end solutions and just giving it slides and saying this is a mutation and this isn't a mutation. We really started with that whole um, annotation framework that I was talking about earlier where we had pathologists annotate uh, various um, pathologies so that we could try to tie back some of these predictions to interpretable features. So in all we came up with 600 interpretable features out of um, about 1.6 million annotations from 5,700 whole site images. So created a massive data set. Um, and we're able, and from that we're able to reduce down to about 600 interpretable features with things like fractal dimension of the cancer associated stroma as an example, or eccentricity of region of necrosis. Um, these are not terms that are really steeped in biology, but they, they are, um, they, you can tie them back in many ways to the histology. Those features have, um, have a distribution across a patient population, um, showing here a mean cluster of macrophages within 80 microns of uh, epithelial stroma interface as an example. And you can just see this large distribution across a single patient population. You can also use these features to, to, to segment or separate out different cancer subtypes or different cancer types. So this is breast cancer, stomach, lung adeno, lung squame, and skin. And you can see this cluster analysis has a tendency to separate these. Um, and you can see this even a little bit better where you're looking at individual clusters and how they have a tendency to be higher, uh, you know, higher or lower uh, for any given uh, particular cancer type. For, for example, if we look at macrophages, we see high amounts of macrophages in lung as, as something that you might expect. Um, we can take those interpretable features a little bit further and predict gene expression patterns um, using TCGA data set. And so we're able to get um, associations like the density of plasma cells is highly associated with IgG expression, which we would expect, not highly associated with TGF-beta as an example, but the density of fibroblasts is more associated with things like TGF-beta, which is something that we might expect. And so we can use this as well to predict um, gene status or mutational status. So we made predictions for HRD, uh, for example, BRCA mutations, uh, in breast with reasonable area under the curve. And this is again, just based on H and E. And we can then go backwards and say, which of the features are, was most involved or most associated with giving us these strong predictions. And so things like fibroblasts within the CSI uh, was a really strong predictor or strong contributor into the prediction of, um, of HRD status in this particular patient population. We show others in this paper, um, IO related ones as well. What kind of utility, this may have utility. We believe that this type of work has utility in discovery, augmenting molecular data, but because h &E is such a rich abundance, you know, it's such a rich data source across so many trials. And there's so many trials that have not collected data like RNA-seq or molecular data, or they're on biopsies and you just don't have enough that this could be good enough, at least to give you some good hypotheses or rule out hypotheses that you might have um, in some of the translational um, research that we've, our, our colleagues are thinking about doing. How did I do on time, uh, Sandy? I uh, hopefully that yeah, we're, we're running just a little late, but we're coming right, into sorry a break, about that. So it's fine. Uh, <laughs> not a that. problem. 
Uh, I, I am uh, happy to take questions and um, you know, I think there's a lot of questions that can come up. We're gonna have continued conversation and time at the very end. Mike, I hope you have time to stay until about, um, I don't know which coast you're on, 1 p.m. I am on the East Coast. Yeah, I can try to stick around. Um, I know you're having a discussion later, I think too, about uh, clinical yeah. use. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'll try to stick around. And, the and, and Tom Fuchs is gonna be on yep. and he'll give some you know, interesting um, corollary kind of information and then we can talk some more about it. But but we do have time for a couple of questions and then we'll take a short break. So if people have questions, go ahead. Hey, Cliff. Keeping quiet. I have a question, Mike. This is Cliff. Hey, Cliff. Um, just a thought. Um, we're, we're, we're working on a way to, it's essentially a strip of all H&E. And so the, every slide that gets our multiplex, we'll also have a, a perfect H&E and then will register those images into a single image, multi-layer image. Um, we'll, I think the, the AI opportunity on multiplex immunofluorescence may be somewhat challenged just because of the training burden, but, <laughs> um, but, the, um, but we will potentially in the future for every, S, every slide that gets a multiplex immunofluorescence, we will have the H&E of it as well. Mm. And I'm just thinking about the potential additive mm. value there where we could leverage some of your tools and add them to what we're finding. Yeah, that would be interesting. I mean, I, I think even just having, you know, same patient samples would be, would alone be beneficial if you had a panel of quantitative um, biomarkers from, from your stuff and we had an H&E from the same patient and we could correlate various possible imputed yep. gene expression patterns to whether or not we're really seeing those. So I think that that would be interesting. Certainly, yeah, if you stripped it, that would, that would probably be the easy, you know, obviously the easiest thing. We have to do some validations as to whether the stripping method is in any way impacting our models, uh, stuff like that. Yep. But yeah, interesting. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, Sharmisa has a question in the uh, chat. You want me to read it, Sharmisa, or you want to unmute and? Oh. You can read it, Sandy. Uh, okay, so Sharmisa asks, um, as AI, AI algorithms are developed, how do we ensure human interventions and annotations are uniform and reproducible? Mm. And I'll have a related question. So you alluded to the fact that you know, in your PDL one expression analysis, you might be more sensitive, but then the question also begs uh, for specificity. And when it comes to drugs, we want to be more sensitive and maybe a little less specific. But when it comes to not giving drugs, maybe the opposite is important. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I mean, re that... reproducibility, sensitivity, specificity. How do you think about all that? Yeah. I mean, those are really good points. I mean, in this case, sensitivity is definitely better for us if we want to get patient on drug. We're looking for an excuse to get patient on drug. I think that this is a good one. Um, if you're, you know, if you have an opposite problem where you're not going to treat, um, or, uh, then, you know, but it, it's sort of, it's where the data is pointing us in many ways. I think Sandy, like I, I did, we didn't come in with a preconceived hypothesis that that's what we wanted. It's just sort of turned out to be, right, right. Um, and we, we see this, we see this quite a bit and it could be unique to IHC. We, you know, it's a very specific IHC, um, test. We don't see it in everything. Um, but I think it's a good, you know, it's a good point on this question of, um, human interventions and annotations that are uniform, how do we ensure that? Um, I mean, we do do QC, I, you know, they, this is a tough one too. It's sort of what's really, really ground truth. Um, training, you know, we do, there's a fair amount of training. We try to have, at least in the models we develop, we try to go through extensive training. We try to find experts in the area, for NASH is a good example. We don't just have anybody annotate NASH. We have liver pathologists with years of experience in NASH on our contributor network who help us do that. Um, and we also hope to some extent that the more readers we can get who can annotate well, there's a consensus, right? There's a washout effect in a way of, of, um, of variability that we hope to get rid of. If we had very few readers, the higher variability in annotations would become a, a problem for us. So we, in some ways, that was the whole intent, I think, of creating a large crowdsource based approach. I, I really like the crowdsource out. approach and collecting data. It gives you the opportunity to, yeah. um, in, you know, get an analysis multiple times potentially and compare those times and do the kind of QA you talk about. Right. Um, right. Um, right. So iPad uh, has her hand up and I'll warn you that's Laura Esserman. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Laura. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Good. So I, you know, I, I think that, um, just, just a quick answer is that, you know, we may not be, <clears throat> it may not necessarily 
be that we should be looking for any excuse to get someone on a drug because drugs come with side effects sure. as well. And, and being more specific, it's one of the things that we've learned in iSpy is that, you know, that, that, that just cause you have a, that there are many things that determine response and, um, you know, like we found a group of HER2 positive patients that are luminal B that don't respond to the targeted therapies. And so they respond to something else. So we wanna make sure, I, I think it's, I, I think one of the things that you have that's really important is not to have preconceived notions right. and to have that data that allows us then to align, you know, assignments and outcomes and to learn. And to that point, the question that I had as I was sort of thinking about this is that, you know, it may be that the background, you know, that 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 we should be analyzing some of the multiplex information in context. And by context, I mean it's it's you know, if you were to do like our part or a card analysis and sort of look at, you know what are the biologic associations of these variables? And so maybe that the immune multiplex is more informative in the setting of dense fibrosis, or maybe it's not, you know, that it, it you know, that there, that you want the opportunity to be able to ask the question Yes. in an immune desert. What are the things that, yes. that run in, in, you know, and there's a number, and I think this is back to Cliff's point is that there are a number of things that you are looking at that could be another way for us to even be thinking about it and that, because I've seen even, there was a recent, I don't know if it was from your group or another, but this, this uh, look at, at benign biopsies and sort of that there was a, an, an, an AI approach to determining who was really at risk and who's not. I mean, this whole thing about LCIS and atypia and who's really at risk probably has, that's probably something that some of the features you have could unlock for us. For sure, for sure. And that we then say, okay, in this context, yeah. What matters? Because if you ask in the whole context, you're going to lose it. Mm -hmm. That maybe we need to start thinking about these categories. And again, these robust categories that are made more robust by, by AI is, is like, what is fibrosis? What is dense? Mm -hmm. What, you know, what mm -hmm. are some of the categories that you think might be emerging mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we should just have mm -hmm. as our standard annotation as we think about mm -hmm. moving forward? Mm -hmm. I think that if I understand what you're saying, I think I understand what you're saying. As an example, we have seen, we treat non-small cell lung cancer as a, as a population. We've seen, you know, we see differences depending on the biomarkers we're looking at between, um, or associations between acinar, papillary, solid tumor subtypes that exist within that population that's largely overlooked. It's not really something that, that people look at, but when you, when you marry um, you know, the sort of AI-based pathology readouts, as an example, to the other mm -hmm. analyses that are being done, things start to make sense, or you start to tease out yeah. of a population further subpopulations. Yeah, that's, that's, and that, that some of these, some of these things may, the context may matter. Right. So fibrosis or not, or papillary or not, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. something else that, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that if we should collect the data in such a way. Yes. That, that, that we can learn in that context. Yes. As opposed to just analyzing it all together. Yes. And then I think we can use, the, I couldn't agree the, then we can more. use, yeah. Yeah, you're preaching the choir. I mean, I, I think that the, I think we, especially within pharma where we were collecting lots of RNA-seq and lots of whole exome seq data, as much data, it was always data, data, data. And then there was like, oh, and their pathology, their PDL one non-small cell lung cancer. That's the data that you have in that category that's it. that you can <laughs> add to these really rich data sets that we're collecting in other areas. So I, I've been, you know, preaching quite extensively that now that AI exists and you can collect this data at scale, fairly reliably, that that data should be all always collected um, on these data sets and should be included yeah. in these analyses. And then later you can then put it through mm -hmm. like an R part or a classification mm -hmm. regression mm -hmm. tree, and you can yeah. sort of exactly. allow the allow the information to be used in context as opposed to all together where it may yeah. not be. Totally, I couldn't yeah. agree more, yes. So we should work. Let's write a review article on that, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's get people I, I, thinking uh, that way. I, I, wanna, I wanna do two things. I wanna read Alex Zelay's nice comment to um, Charmista's question. And then I wanna let Richard have the last question. Uh, so, so Alex says, validate the humans by annotating each data item by multiple individuals, preferably randomly selected from a pool, and then evaluate the consistency 
maybe yeah, even so randomly so provide so blind yeah, mirror images or rotations to avoid human orientation bias. And I'm getting background. I don't know from it. Um, so uh, you, you all can see that in the chat. That's to everyone. I'll let you read it. But uh, Richard had his hand up. So I'm going to let him have the last question before we take a short break. After Richard's question and answer, we're going to reconvene in 10 minutes at uh, 2 15 Eastern, 11 15 Pacific. Um, and it will be Alex Lay's turn. So, Richard, your thank question. you. Thank you. So, um, I have a question about, um, I would say, sort of Achilles' heel. I was really surprised that if you look at all of these sort of important variables that your analysis showed, it really came down to things like fibrosis or necrosis. So, very, you know, sort of kind of. Um, bold things, not a lot of detailed things. And I'm wondering if that doesn't reflect variability in the H&E data. You have different stains, you have different slide thicknesses, you have different imaging, you have a lot of morphological minor differences that may be kind of showing up. Uh, just like with the immunostains, you have potential antibody issues that may get uh, averaged out. So I'm wondering if you're not averaging out some of the potentially important information in the H&E simply because it can be variable. Um. Or not? <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know. I mean, how would we know that, or how would we measure that out with multiple? Um, well, I mean, do you get the same yeah. results from a three micron section versus a seven micron right, section? Right, right. So stain, sort of stain. You think this is sort of the stain? Stain specific. slide. I mean, you're dealing yeah. with a physical object. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a good point. I mean, I think that we can do those kinds of studies to see if that's sort of what we are keying in on. I mean, I'm not sure if you're trying to make this point too, but it's in some ways it's a little. It's a little deflating if we're just coming up with some of these big, big things, these robust things that we already know are relevant. We know fibrosis is relevant. We know PDL1 is relevant. Um, and so we're, we're, what we're doing is just measuring these much more accurately and maybe and maybe getting uh, more sense. That's, yeah, Maybe that's sort of one. The other yeah. point is, is and yeah. you were talking about how you're averaging out all of your, if you have multiple um, yeah. graders, you're averaging yeah. out their variability. Maybe you're yeah. averaging out the variability in the h and as well. Yeah, it's definitely possible. Um, there's more sensitive, I mean, I'm not showing any of this data. I mean, there are things we're picking up that humans can't see uh, as potential predictors and stuff. And it's, it's further away from validating or being clinically relevant. So we have a tendency, to, or at least um, this talk had a tendency to sort of try to show the things that could advance a drug program fairly, you know, fairly easily. Um, so, but some of these other more subtle things that humans can't do, the so-called, you know, the, the human impossible features, we see a lot of interesting stuff there too. Great, thanks. Yeah, thanks. All right, thanks, everybody. We're going to thanks. take a short break, uh, eight minute break, seven minute break. Uh, we'll, we'll resume at uh, quarter past the hour, whatever hour you're on um, with Alex Soleil. <laughs> 